All right, you guys can get your Bibles out. Turn them to the good Old Testament passage of Deuteronomy chapter 5. You can get your lift notes ready. If you're just joining us, we are in week number four of the Ten Commandments. This is a fun one. They're all good, but I'm very passionate about them. I'm very passionate about all of them. What am I saying? Here we go. Let's just get into God's Word. Let me give you a little context, though. What are the purpose of the commandments? That's very important. I'm going to be very brief. If you were not with us for any of these messages and want to get caught up to speed, you can go on weareelevation.com, click on the little tab that says messages, or scroll down on the home page, and there's all of our messages are always archived in both video and podcast. But I want to highlight the purpose of the commandments because it's very important. Many people look at the Ten Commandments as rules that we need to follow in order to earn a relationship with God. And if there's anything we've hoped to establish in these first three weeks, it's that is absolutely not their intention. That is not their purpose. That is not God's goal. It's not to give you a bunch of do's and don'ts that you have to live up to in order to earn, by your own merits, a relationship with God. What's key to the context and many verses that we've looked at, looked at to interpret the Ten Commandments, it all comes down to this. They are the love response. They are our relationship response to what God has already done in our lives. And we believe they're all valid. They all continue to today because they carry the character and nature of God that hasn't changed. And so you look at the context of when they were originally given, it was when God created the people of Israel, when he saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And so he called them by name, he saved them, he forgave them, forgave them, he protected them, he provided for them, he gave them promises. All those words you can apply to the new covenant with Jesus. That's what he does for us. That's his intention. God, for God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son that whoever believed in him will not perish but have eternal life. God did all of those things, and here's the key. God does all of that on his own initiation. It's, we haven't done anything to earn it. And so the Ten Commandments come on the heels of what you could say is all this grace. God just pours out grace on the people of Israel, undeserved goodness. He chose them. He called them. He saved them. He forgave them. He redeemed them. And they're kind of like squiggling in rebellion the whole time, and he does it anyways. That's grace. They certainly aren't perfect and don't have it all together. And then as a response to all this relationship that God has initiated, then there's the commandments that come of, so how do you walk with me? Well, you put me first. You have no other gods before me, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where they come. So very briefly, just want you to make sure you have in mind as we look at commandments, these are our love response to God, to walk with him in life. So number four, here we go. Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15 encapsulate the fourth commandment. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it, or the word is guard, guard it as holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a day of Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant or your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep or guard the Sabbath day. So on the very basics of it, within this few verses, there is a command, a Sabbath day or a day of Sabbath. We'll get to the meaning of that word in a moment. A day of Sabbath. 
And the, it's very basic. Don't do ordinary work. Six days you shall work, it says, but on this seventh day of Sabbath, don't do ordinary work. Nobody within the extended family. And so they lived at a time where there was, it was big households. So it was typically not just, you know, a mom and a dad and 2.3 kids. It was mom and a dad and aunt and uncle and eight kids and grandma and grandpa. And it's this big extended kind of beautiful picture of an extended spiritual family. And then there's people hired hands and sojourners. And so it's just, it's a big, a big crew was a typical household. That was done for many reasons because typically you had a family business. There's protection in larger numbers, all of these things. So nobody, not even your donkey, is allowed to work on those days. And then the second part, which can actually be hidden if we're not looking for it, remember and reflect upon what God has already done in your life. So it's a day of celebration. It's a day of worship. Listen in verse 15. So you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath. That is one of the many ways that God makes it clear the Sabbath day is supposed to be one in which you slow down and you look back upon, you remember, you reflect upon, and ultimately move forward with thanksgiving and praise. You look back on what God has done in your life. You reflect. You think about the grace in your life. You think about all these things that God has done, all the undeserved goodness. You think about everything good in life that you have and you recognize that it's a gift from God. Hold on to those thoughts for a moment. These verses hearkened back to something really deep that is very important, which is God's not giving a new command here. Rather, he's reminding them of something that God built in to the created order. So I want to take us back to the book of Genesis, and that's part of what gives us confidence that when we look at these Ten Commandments, and there's the command to take a Sabbath, to set apart one day a week where you don't work and you slow down, you reflect, you worship, you remember what God has done, you speak about it to one another, you praise God, you live in a beautiful day of restful worship. That's not just a command that we could say, oh, well, that was for then, it's no longer for now. No, not only does Jesus affirm it, which we'll look at in a minute, but it's one of those things that is built into the very creative order of God. So let's look at that. Genesis 1, you know the story of creation and God created the world and there's this, the days and the nights, the mornings and the evenings, etc. So fast forwarding to the very end of that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 it says, or actually 128. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He creative, created them. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, day he rested from all his work it's key to note that that word rested that God did on the seventh day of creation is the word the Hebrew word Shabbat what is translated into English as Sabbath so God Sabbathed on the seventh day right there in creation in God's created order there is a Sabbath day from the very beginning so why did God do that it certainly was not because God was tired it's because he knew we would be and he wanted us to live within a certain creative order a power rhythm as I like to think of it the word Sabbath comes or the, the root of it means to repose to lie back in rest so this Sabbath day that God built into the created, creative order and modeled for us, which he later makes very clear, the Sabbath was not for me, it's for you. And Jesus said it really directly like that. 
That Sabbath day, a, a repose with God. That's kind of a weird word for us. We don't, it's like an old English word. We don't talk like, hey, how was your repose? It's a little odd. But there's a deep beauty in it. It's a restful posture. So deep, built into the created order, God has a restful posture. Now again, is that because God needed to rest because he was tired? Not a chance. Like eating and sleeping and breathing. You think of all these things that when you talk about created order, there's a lot that's way outside of our control. You know, humans, humanity has the tendency to kind of think we, all, we got it all together and we're so strong. And, you know, as long as we have, you know, Red Bull and other things, then we can just defy all this creative order of God. But if you think about how God has created us, there is so much that's outside of our control, like the reality that we need to sleep about a third of our life if we want our brain to function properly and our immune system to function properly and to not like die early like of exhaustion and other things, that's weird, right? You, you, none of, we did not have the choice. We didn't get to say, you know, kind of like a, a little, uh, you know, brainstorming session with God. Well, how should we create humans, you know? And what do, what do you think? Six hours of sleep, 10 hours, eight hours, two, why sleep at all? It's just very interesting. Within God's design, he created us to need certain things and we really, except to our very clear detriment, we don't get to decide we don't need them. If you try to decide and defy the created order of God, let's say in eating, drinking, sleeping, you are not gonna be thriving. And so there's just this humility in it all of like, I am not in charge. And when I try to buck the created order of God's good intentions, I suffer. And so there's this perspective that God has in the Bible of the created order is very good. And so I would encourage you all to take that perspective where you can see where you can find things in God's good created order. No, it's not to hold you back. These are the power rhythms so that you can thrive and be fully alive. And right in the created order, along with eating and sleeping and drinking, God puts a Sabbath day saying, not for me, it's for you. You need it just as much as you need sleep and water and food. It is within my created order that is good. Why? Well, I like to look at the chronology of it, and it was pointed out to me by a mentor. But if Sabbath day is a day of resting in God's presence, it's, if it's a day of looking for those things that God has done in our life that we can be thankful for and grateful for, if it's a day of praise, if it's a day of worship, if it's a day of just the best we can possibly do to just have that pure communion and connection with God. What's amazing is from humanity's perspective, it was the first day humanity was alive. So what is that saying? God wanted humanity to start their existence with a day of Sabbath rest in his presence worshiping him, communing with him, having one of those beautiful walks with God in the cool of the day, and then go out and work. So this picture emerges that we're meant to live from this place of Sabbath rest in God. We're meant to commune with God, to connect with God, to worship God, to get filled up, as it were, and then go out and work, go out and do so Sabbath, as much of anything, I believe, shows a pattern of where we are supposed to live from. We're supposed to live from that place of intimacy, communion, connection, worship, filled up with God's presence, and then go out into the world of six days of hard work, and you've got good fruit to share. And God affirms this reality when, in the book of Leviticus, 23, and I know it's often not like a, a, a common quotation, but we looked at that about six weeks ago. And the title of the message was Celebrations. 
of life where we see God specifically tell the people of Israel, here are seven different parties that I want you to build into your calendar. Some of them are up to a week long, a couple of them in fact, where I want you to take the whole week off and I want you to have a celebration, a party that is basically an extended Sabbath day where you have feasts, you gather the family together, you have celebration, you have dancing, you have music, you have praise, you have thanksgiving. And I want you to just commune with me in this extended Sabbath week. And where it gets confirmed is that in multiple ones of those holidays that God calls holy days, where God says, this is how I want to teach you to party. This is how I want to teach you to live in healthy power rhythms of life. What is not a coincidence is that in multiple times, you start the celebration with a Sabbath day. It starts with Sabbath. And some of them start with Sabbath, go for seven days and finish with Sabbath. Why? What's the point? Sabbath is the place that God created us in his good creative order to live from. It's huge. Sabbath is the rhythm of life that demonstrates we were made to live from communion with God. Relationship, communion, intimacy, worship is where we live from and all good work flows out of that place. Let me give you one example of a typical or a potential Friday night Jewish Sabbath. And then I would say, I'd encourage you, see the beauty in it and maybe there are some things, some aspects where God might be inviting you to grow in the ways that you are practicing aspects of Sabbath in your life. There's a beautiful picture that's painted. So I'd imagine to kind of just, or I would invite you to kind of imagine a, a scene here. So it's Friday afternoon, coming towards the end of a long six days of work. It's a hard, you know, six days, toiling in the field, growing the crops, whatever it may be, hunting, and a meal is starting to be prepared, a very special meal, kind of the highlight of the week. This is a, about to be a big family gathering a couple hours from now where everybody's going to stop working, where the kids are going to gather, the parents, the grandparents, some aunts and uncles, that family friend who just somehow became part of the family, those who work in the house. And you guys are about to have the, the most excited, uh, enthusiastic, special meal of the whole week. But a couple hours prior, there's lots of people are, are preparing that meal. And then as the, the sun begins to set, everybody stops working. They come in, they, they, they wash their hands from the field, and they, they begin to gather around kind of the, you know, my, what you might call the family room, but it was most likely kind of an outdoor room at the time. For the sake of imagination, say it's a nice kind of cool summer evening, the sun is setting, and all the family sits and ah, they start to take a breath together. And then, interestingly, the mom or the ima, the matriarch of the clan, will stand up and she begins the time. She opens the Sabbath with a lighting of two candles to commemorate both Deuteronomy and Exodus, where the Sabbath is specifically given as a command to guard it, to keep it holy, to not forget it, to let it be that built-in created rhythm of life that's a gift from God. And then she'll go on to say a couple prayers of, of welcome and, and blessing. And here's an example of one. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe, who has set us apart or made us holy, sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to light the Shabbat candles. So the matriarch gets up and, and really sets apart, consecrates this time, this Sabbath day as a holy activity with God. And it went from Friday night evening all the way through Saturday evening. 
And the Friday evening meal is the beginning. It's setting it apart as holy. It's saying our time to rest, to be with God, to repose, to celebrate, to worship, to enjoy each other's company, to enjoy a good meal from the Lord, to have that posture of gratitude and praise. It starts now. And then she would give some some extemporaneous personal prayers if she wanted. And then it would move to a blessing of the children where typically the the fathers and mothers would get up and they would speak a blessing over the children, oftentimes laying a hand on their head and they would speak that number six, a blessing that may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And then depending on what the parents wanted to do, they might give a specific blessing of may you be like Samson or may you be like David or may you be like... Uh, Ruth or Naomi or Esther and then if they felt so inclined they would go to each child and speak a personal blessing over them or even a blessing of how they saw them doing good things this week and then it would often move to where the the patriarch of the clan would stand up and he would bless the Ema, he would bless his wife Oftentimes in tradition, Proverbs 31 would use, and it was called the woman of valor blessing, where the husband would bless the wife. And Proverbs 31 has got all sorts of wonderful blessings about a a woman of God's strength and valor and beauty. And then it might move on to where they would do the shalom aleichem, which is the welcoming of the, the angels that would partake with them to protect them in their shalom or in their Sabbath uh, happenings and, and celebrations. Then it might move on to the Kiddush, where this is really kind of the, the picture of what this is all about. And here's an example of the blessing. They would say, the sixth day, the heavens and the earth and all they contained were completed. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work he had done. And God rested on the seventh day from all the work. And he blessed the seventh day and he made it holy for us. For on that day, he rested from all the work which he had done. And the diners listening would raise their glass and say, to life. And then the the leader would go on to say, blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe who has sanctified us with your commandments and favored us, given us in love and favor his holy Sabbath, his Shabbat, as an inheritance, as a remembrance of the act of creation. This day is the beginning of all holy days, a remembrance of all the exodus from Egypt, for you have chosen us and you have blessed us from among all the nations and you have bequeathed to us as your your holy Shabbat in love and favor. After the meal, they would recite another blessing and then often do Sabbath, sing special Sabbath songs called the Zimmerat or Zimmerat. A combination of songs of praise and thanks they were also very playful they would often end up dancing around tables together arm in arms one Jewish family described it like this on this kind of Friday evening to Saturday evening we would enjoy slow festive meals catching up on everyone's news with one another singing special songs taking walks or naps studying the Bible together full of thanks and praise. So this Sabbath meal, I'm just trying to paint a picture here of of the, the way, a typical way that the Jewish families might celebrate Shabbat down through the ages. But it's the meal, it's the prayers, it's the gathering of family together, extended family. It's rest, it's play, it's celebration, it's songs, it's thanksgiving, it's praise. And the big picture is it's all clearly putting God at the center of life. It's putting God at the center of family life. It's saying that God is the giver of all good things from the fruit of the vine to our children, to the the blessing of protection from the angels, to the exodus from Egypt, to, to a wife of valor, to the promises that he has given us, to the 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 food on the table. It's everything. Every good gift in life is a good gift from God. James 1 specifically says that to us. And so the Sabbath meal, the beginning of the Sabbath day, is one way to put into practice with the whole family that God is the center of life. He has given us many good gifts. So this Sabbath here is this rhythm that 
keeps us in healthy relationship with God and each other, with the world around us, with God as our provider, our king, our savior, our redeemer, the one we look to for all good things to come and the one who has given us every good thing in life. And there's this beautiful tradition in, in, with our, among our Jewish brothers and sisters that, and you start it with this beautiful meal of, of Shabbat. Jewish rabbis have been known to say, more than Israel keeping the Sabbath, it was the Sabbath that has kept Israel. And that, I feel that one. Because we do Sabbath in our home and it's the Sabbath that keeps us, man. This is part of God's good, created order, power rhythms to keep us alive, to keep us thriving. So let me fast forward real quick or go quickly on a few aspects about Sabbath, and we'll close in about 10 minutes. The reason why I share that story of a typical Jewish Sabbath is I just want to paint a picture I've been inspired by it lately, even though we've been keeping Sabbath for almost 15 years. And, and it's one of the, it truly is kind of the sacred day for us because we, you know, while this is your Sabbath, this is a work day for us. So we typically do the Friday night to Saturday evening, but we're always thinking of ways, even adapt, being adaptable because life is dynamic and it changes. And especially as kids are growing and in and of the house and out of the house and in various things, there's, it's, the question that's on our minds for my wife and I leading our home is how do we continue to Sabbath well in the midst of a changing life and growing family and changing circumstances, all those things. So I want to encourage you guys to be thinking about maybe for the, for some of you, it's just the idea of giving a Sabbath day to the Lord is a huge one. A committing to not working and making a weekly commitment to Sabbath is a huge deal. That's awesome. And then there's some of you who are more in that fine tuning of what is a new nuance that God might be asking you to add into it to just can further, to further experience those rhythms of life that God has put in. And I'll, I'll share one for us as we're looking at the kind of that Friday night to Saturday night. So for you guys, it might be Saturday night to Sunday, which by the way, like we're in the Sabbath. You're in the Sabbath right now. I mean, you are doing it. This is, a, this is Sabbath to come and part of the, you know, the Jewish tradition in their Sabbath day, they would go to synagogue and they would do that corporate worship together. So there's kind of the oikos worship where with your family unit, whatever that looks like, there's that special meal that sets aside the day that really is the, the, meant to be the highlight of the week where you feast together, you thank God, you praise God, and, and you are having that holy consecrated time together with your family, and then there's also a corporate aspect where they would go to synagogue and worship together. So this is the corporate aspect. You're doing it. You're Sabbathing. So awesome job. You're already there. You've taken time away from your busy schedule to say no, to be together in worship. I mean, all these things we're talking about, except food. We don't do that all the time, but we do it a lot of times. Coffee. Thank you, Lord. So it's, it's what are we doing here? It's, there's gratitude, thanksgiving, praise, prayers, celebrations, praying for one another, fellowshipping together. I mean, those are, those are key aspects. We are orienting, posturing our hearts to start our week from a place of communion with God. That's Sabbath. That's what it's about. And so you guys are here, you're doing it. And, I, and so I'm just saying, maybe there's some additional ways that can add to it, maybe beforehand, maybe Saturday night, gathering a family meal and having that being the priests of your home and having that worship service in your home around a meal. It can be simple. Like for a long time, we would have Sabbath breakfasts in our house. We'd have family Sabbath brunch and we would make a fun meal that would get the kids excited about getting together. So we'd make something, you know, like pancakes and bacon and, you know, just a yummy family Sabbath meal. And we would do a little Thanksgiving jar. I think I've told you about that a ways in the past where we'd go back and we would say, all right, kids, what's the thing that you were most excited about this week that you can be thankful for? 
whatever it may be, whether it was something at school or something on the sports field, and it's just training, trying to train the mind, that's a good gift from God. That was an answer for prayer. That was something you were concerned about, and we would give it up, try to turn it up to praising God. Something more recently my wife and I are looking on now on Friday nights for us, we may not always gather for a meal. Friday nights is kind of a hard one. We got kids in high school. We got kids out of school like Friday night. You know, that could be a sports night out at football, whatever. But for us, what we're working on saying is, you know what, Friday night sundown, the Lord's Supper. Even if that's five minutes with just my wife and I, maybe hopefully we can do those extended family meals as well. But there's a good meal that doesn't take that long. The Lord's Supper. The sun goes down. Let's consecrate our family once again. Let's say we're starting our Sabbath day, our day of rest and worship and praise and fun and celebration. We're going to start that with the, the great meal, the body and blood of Christ that gets our hearts in that place of rest, saying it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. We are recipients of his grace. At the end of the day, we are we are victorious in Christ. We're grateful and thankful for what he's done, but we need to remember that. Why? Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Because for some reason, humans have the tendency to forget. And start living on our own strength. That's part of why God built in the Sabbath here. So we can come back and we can take that holy moment and take the, the communion elements together and remember it's his body and blood that are the new covenant. It's everything. Every good gift now in life is from Jesus, through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. So we can give him thanks for what he's done. We can praise him for who he is and we can cast all our cares on him. Every hope we have for life is built on what Jesus Christ has done. So we're trying to build that in. And so what it's about is how are those ways where if God put this into the created order, how are we stewarding that well for life? How are we stewarding that well so that our Sabbath is rich so that we're filled up with thanks and praise to go out into the week and do the work that God's called us to do. So I want to highlight just like super fast a couple things. One is that Sabbath is about victory. And I just mentioned it. What victory? Sabbath helps us step back and remember that in the big picture of life, we've already won. That's why we want to take communion, to remember that God in Christ has already saved us. He's already redeemed us. He's already forgiven us. He's already secured us. He's already made us victorious, and we're meant to live from his victory. But can't you feel it? Sometimes you get your head down, grinding in the various battles of life, and we forget, especially when the battle's going hard, we forget ultimately the victory's already won. So the Sabbath does that. It says, take a break. Take a break. You get back to the battle, but take a break reflect on the reality that in Christ you've already won or another one is that Sabbath is about work in no way is the Sabbath denigrating the value of work not at all in fact it affirms that most of life is lived in the space of working and doing the Sabbath command itself says six days you shall labor da 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 so most of life is lived in that space of doing. But Sabbath is meant to put it all into perspective of what are we working for? Where are we working from? Because as humans, we have that tendency to remove God and work for our own agenda and from our own strength. Come on, anybody with me? You know you feel it. And then you stop and you're like, oh my goodness, I need my mind renewed again and again <laughs> to work from his strength and for his agenda or sabbath is about sustainable power many many people burn out in life that is the culture i mean you could sadly say we are living in a culture of burnout but that's because we easily unplug from the source Many people burn out in their jobs, in their marriage, with their parenting, with their ministries, and this is part of God's created good order. Sabbath is meant we guard it, we keep it holy because God wants to keep you from burning out. That is not a fruit of the Spirit, and it's not heroic. It's you thinking you're God. And so God put the Sabbath in there 
so that instead of burning out, we keep burning with holy zeal because we've postured our heart how we're supposed to as childlike, where we need him. And our strength comes from resting in him, not from our own. He gives us strength to be strong, but that takes that intentionality of setting aside the work to say, in your created order, God, I'm not meant to do it alone. There's this beautiful rest that comes through just communing with you, being with you, being your beloved child, fixing my eyes on what you've already done, your power, your grace, your goodness, your promises, and that fills me up to go out and keep burning and doing the six days of work you called me to do. It's a good gift. Jesus said it like this. The Sabbath was made for humanity. It was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Meaning it's a gift. It's a good gift. We don't want to turn down good gifts from Jesus. (laughs) That usually doesn't go well. And lastly, we just want to think about sacred practices. And I've already talked about this. As we look into practices, I'm not trying to prescript anything specific for you. This is, there's a lot of flexibility in this. There's a lot of dynamic reality. There's a lot of ways how you can express this in your family. It's not about a list of rules of do and don'ts. It's about rhythms with intention. It's about what helps us rest physically, refresh emotionally, recharge spiritually, all, to, all while giving thanks and praise to God and enjoying the relationships that God has given us. These are power rhythms of life. And so I want to pause now and pray and just encourage you to, in this week to come, be thinking, be praying, talking with close family, talking with your spouse, talking, looking back into God's word, talking with God. What about this Sabbath gift of God's created order Is he wanting to highlight to you? And are there some practices he might want to encourage you to incorporate into your family power rhythm? Let's pray. I will sing a new song. I will sing a new song. I will dance a new dance.